after Alexander the Great and his two generals leave town. There was once a good and honest king named Amra Shakti who had three ignorant and lazy sons. Many educational experts offered His Majesty their theories about the three princes' proper instruction for managing the kingdom in the future. But nothing was working. King Amra Shakti was in despair. His hair grew grayer and grayer every day, and what his sons needed to know in order to rule was just disappearing across the horizon, and he was going to die, and his kingdom was going to lie in ruins. If they didn't learn soon, he was in trouble. In modern management speak, the kingdom had what is called a profound succession problem. Then down from the mountains comes a sage. His name is Vishnu Sharma, who says he can import, uh, impart sorry, to the three doltish princes all they need to know to become intelligent and wise rulers. Instruction comes in the form of a daily dose of animal fables. <laughs> and the whole process can be accomplished, he says to the king, in six months, if the princes will pay close attention. They will, says the king. So here's a slide I happen to find. And you can see uh, the king speaking to Vishnu Sharma. He is, of course, the man in the white beard. And the three boys rather nervously hovering around in the background. He, Vishnu Sharma is explaining his method. And the king is whispering to his son, put that sword away now. You will listen to what the man in the white beard says. And they do. For the next six months, Vishnu Sharma tells the three princes his mix of animal stories. The old man has moved into the palace and there's no escaping him. <laughs> but in the end, the princes learn what they have to and they are clearly well suited for the new burden of leadership which will fall on their shoulders. King Amara Shakti is delighted knowing that he can now die with at least one problem solved. Vishnu Sharma is an old man, as you can see with his white beard, and he wants nothing except to return to the mountains which he does with everyone's thanks and blessings, but only after he has penned his stories, the Panchatantra. Thus our book has become a genre called the mirror for princes. Instruction given to princes is part of their training to be monarchs. So the Panchatantra's political usage of animal stories has by now veered quite radically away from the Buddha's original spiritual message. We are in Machiavellian territory. Many great names can be associated with this Indian incarnation of these animal stories. I mentioned Sir Richard Burton earlier. He was only 26 when he translated a Hindi version of the Panchatantra in India in 1847. The handwritten notebook containing this first literary effort remo remained with him until his death in 1890. Then, somehow, it survived hardly noticed for 156 years, deep in the bowels of the Royal Anthropological Institute in London. It was finally published, believe it or not, posthumously in 2003 in, of all places, Bangkok. So you, do get, you begin to get this feeling that these stories are not self-contained. They just sort of erupt all over the place. And why would Richard Burton's first effort of doing a, a translation lie in the bowels of a building in London and then get published in Bangkok. That's the kind of thing that, well, that stimulates my obsession, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we're about to begin the third stage, and the long and short of it is that the Sanskrit Panchatantra slowly becomes famous in India. As king after king in India hears about this wondrous book, every monarch wants a manuscript of his own. Yet obtaining one is not always an easy matter. Why should one king want to offer this practical wisdom, this educational technology, to a neighbor who later might become a rival and use it against him? So you tend to keep the book to yourself. Books were rare, like Rolls Royces or something. But eventually, six or seven hundred years later, Vishnu Sharma's word of mouth about this book leaks out, probably as gossip moving up and down the Silk Route. The news reaches the Sassanid court of Kushu I, who was a great Zoroastrian king of Persia in 570 AD. Here's a picture of him, quite a chap. 
If you look carefully, you can see that he, first of all, the dish is gold, so he, he, you know, he was powerful. But I, what I love is all the different animals. You can see uh, lots of different types of animals. Uh, ibex, and you see water buffalo. And there he is on this giant horse with his bow. Uh, and even there's lions up on the top right. And there's something coming and biting the horse. But it's just a marvelous piece, I think, that. So he's heard about this book, and he knows it's in India. And he dispatches his personal doctor, whose name is Borzoi, to India with instructions to get a copy at any cost. Now, here's the popular, or one of the popular versions of the story, because I'm telling you the stories that are around the animal stories. Inside all of these versions, there are these animal stories. I'm not telling you that. You can read the book, because I would take up all day telling you animal stories. But the story of how the book survives, like Moses in his basket, is what I find amazing. One day, King Koshru reads an old manuscript that tells of a secret elixir that can raise the dead to life again. The book says this elixir is extracted from herbs that only grow in the high mountains of India. Well, King Koshru is obviously quite interested in such a new technology, so he summons his doctor, Borzo, and says, who knows Sanskrit, but he says, you go to India, please, and find me this miraculous herb to make this elixir. This is from an Arabic manuscript, but that's where one of this, this story exists in lots of different versions, and one of them is the Arabic. So, laden down with gold and silver to defray the cost of his expedition, and carrying a letter of introduction and sumptuous gifts for the king of India, Boisroy leaves Persia to begin his quest. That's him taking off. The king of India is absolutely delighted to receive Burzoi and gives him a royal pass and guides to help him to go search in the mountains for these magical herbs. The understanding, however, that if Burzoi does find any that work, the king of India wants some too. Perfectly understandable. So with the help of many local experts, Burzoi combs the mountains of northern India looking for the herbs mentioned in King Kushru's book. But to no avail. Whatever herb Dr. Borzoi tribes or mixture of herbs on various donated dead corpses don't work. The dead stay dead. <laughs> Months pass, and Borzoi nervously comes to the conclusion that the book that first gave King Kushru the information about this elixir is fraudulent. To say that he is deeply stressed about returning to Persia empty-handed would be putting it mildly. But in his darkest hour, a famous Indian sage comes to his rescue. Here he is. And this sage says, look, Borzoi, I think you've been making a literal misinterpretation here. The elixir, he says, is not a concoction of herbs. It's a book. And the story read by King Koshru in Persian is an allegory, not a literalism. The high mountains of India, he continues, stand for the wise and learned men and women of lofty intellect. The herbs are their writings, and the elixir of life is the wisdom extracted from these writings. It is wisdom that revives the dead intelligence and buried thoughts of the ignorant and lazy. So Borzoi thanks this wise man who we see here. He thanks him profusely, and he leaves the mountains and returns to the court of the king of India to explain the situation. Please, your majesty, he asked very politely, may I have a copy of the Panchatantra to take home with me to Persia for King Kushru? Nay, nay, says the king of India, that book is my most precious possession, locked in my library and guarded night and day by my fiercest warriors. But you're welcome to stay in the palace and read it from cover to cover, if you wish. Well, he does wish, and that's what he does. However, he sets himself the task of translating the book from Sanskrit into Old Persian, also known as Pavlevi. Every day, Borzo goes into the royal library, talks to the guards, and then sits down and reads the old book, the Panchatantra, which is in the library of the King of India. And then he retires to his room, and he makes a copy in his own writing in Pavlevi. 
And from time to time, he takes these little packets that he's done, these translations, and he ships them back to Persia in diplomatic bags. <laughs> so over the months, finally, this particular task is completed. And Borzoi returns to the court of Kushru and is received with great joy and celebration when he delivers the Indian book that is now a Pavlavi manuscript. Here we, here he comes. There he is. You see him. Mm -hmm. I can't read the Persian, but uh, that's him there. And there's King Kushru. This is from the Shramana, I think. And uh, everybody's saying, my God, how did he do it? So he put it in diplomatic bags, you know. <laughs> oh, great. Anyway, the king is terribly... <laughs> The king is terribly happy. Um, and he reads a bit of the book, or has it read to him, and the deep wisdom in it stirs him no end. He even builds a great library in which this book is encased in, with a Panchatantra, five chapters given the place of honor. But because, this is a footnote here, because this is a Zoroastrian kingdom and not a Hindu one, the manuscript's title is changed. It's no longer called the Panchatantra, it's called Karirak Ud Damanak, named after the jackals in the first chapter of the Panchatantra. It is also true that the Persians of yore found it difficult, so we're told, to pronounce Sanskrit words. So it's no longer called the Panchatantra, as it makes this particular part of its trip. As to Borzoi, here we go again, the king offers him riches, titles, anything he wants. Borzoi says, no, all I want is a biography of my adventures mentioned in all future editions of Karirak Ud Damanak, so that his role can be preserved and remembered throughout history. So this the king does. He calls his greatest scribe and says, get this man's story down and make it good. Well, it was a good story. So Borzoi was very intelligent. We know quite a bit about his intelligence and his physical skills as a doctor. So this story was written, and then they told it. These are, these are the uh, four main characters of the first uh, tantra of the, Pasha, of the Panchatantra, or of the first book section of Khalil and Dimna, the bull, the king lion, and the two jackal brothers. And it is the jackal brothers who give the name to all books after it uh, leaves India. So here is a famous storyteller in the court of uh, Kushru I, telling the biography of the noted Borzoi, who managed to smuggle in a copy of the Panchatantra back to Persia. So we're now going to the fourth stage of the journey. It starts in the Abbasid Caliphate. This is a really important part, because it is because of this period that we do have this book. Uh, this map shows you roughly the extent of the caliphate. The early armies of the Umayyad caliphs have spread the new religion of Islam, and the second Abbasid caliph, al-Mansur, is planning the great translation movement, which will fan out from his new capital in Baghdad hundreds of years in the future, benefiting humanity. He is the ruler who instigates the rescue of ancient Greek, Persian, and Indian knowledge for our future. An awful lot of emphasis is placed on the preservation of Western knowledge of you know, Aristotle, etc., etc. But he also did this other stuff. Here's a picture of Al-Mansur. I think this, the, all these pictures of uh, characters from ancient history all come from the same factory in Cairo or something. They, they all look the same. They're always looking noble. And mm -hmm. I mean, I quite like them, but I, I never can detect a huge difference. I think it's all one artist, but be that as it may. Uh, 